Hello, this is Raimu, and this is part 8 of my introduction to Rust series, taking it one step at a time. Today we're going to be covering collections. So these are types that are provided by Rust Standard Library that are used quite often. And the theme for all of these types is that they store information, usually in the forms of sequences or groups. So let's get started. The first collection that I want to talk about is the vector. A vector is a pretty simple collection that's used to store a list of things. And the type in Rust for a vector is called just vec for short. Here's how you would make a new one of them. And I chose primes here because we're going to have a vector that's storing prime numbers. So one of the methods that comes with vec is called push. And this is what we're going to use to push numbers into our vector. The vec type implements the debug trait. So we can take this and do print line and use that sequence with primes and show that this prints out the list two three four although four isn't a prime number <laughs> so I should fix that right okay so that's all well and good but if we hover over this rust conveniently tells us there's an easier way to construct a vector and that's with the vec exclamation mark or macro so let's rewrite this and just say let primes equal vec macro and then instead of these, just put 2, 3, 5. That also works. So however you make a vector, let's go over a few other things you can do with it. So let's say I put in 1, and we learn later that 1 is not a prime number. You can remove from a vector with the remove method. Here you give an index. So the index is a number from 0 to the length of the vector minus 1 and it tells which of the numbers to remove. A vector stores its items in order in memory. So indexing a vector either to remove or to display it, such as if we say print line, the second prime number is primes one. As long as we make this mutable, we see that we could remove that one and then we can also index into the prime numbers to get whichever one we want. Now, a common operation that you might want to do with a vector is to go through and do something with each thing in the vector. Maybe we're going to print them out individually. So without introducing anything new, what we can do is just say, let's make an index that starts at zero. And we say, while that index is less than the primes len, which is another method that gives us the length of the vector, we can say print line. The prime number is so, so it's i. And since it's Based off of zero, but we kind of like to show the user numbers based off of one. That's just my preference. We'll just add one there and we'll just use the indexer. Don't forget to add one to i, like I did when I was recording this. Otherwise, you get an infinite loop. And so we printed out each of the prime numbers individually. But there's a better way to do this without having to increment by one ourselves and to have an index, and it's called the iterator. We can get an iterator for any collection by saying, something like primes iter equals primes dot iter. We can see the type of the iterator here. The way we use an iterator is calling its next function over and over again. Each time the next function is called, it gives us an option, which as we've seen before, can either be something or nothing. We can combine that with a while loop by saying while let sum prime equal primes iter. Copy this print, but we'll just remove the index for now. We'll add it back in a second, no worries. And we'll remove this code here. And don't forget to put the next here. And we need to make the iterator mutable because every time we call next, it's going to actually change the state of the iterator to go to the next one. Run that and we see we get the same result as if we had our while loop with an index. But let's say we really wanted to have that index. Iterators provide a method called enumerate, which kind of wraps that iterator into one that not only produces each value, but also gives the index of each value. Here then we would have to change this to a tuple index in the sum, and then we can put back in our number. i plus one, run that, we get our index back. Now you might notice this yellow squiggly, it's the Rust compiler again telling us this could be improved and it's going to allow me to introduce another kind of loop, which is the for loop, which is designed to work in Rust with iterators. You might have seen for in other programming languages that have a different use, but in Rust, the for loop is exclusively for iterators. 
the way we would write this. In this case, I'm just going to let the quick fix change it for me. And this is the form. You just say for the values in the iterator. Run that and it still works. Now another thing here is we don't really need to have this primes iter. We could just take this enumerator that we got and put it directly in the for loop. So each step here, we're doing the same thing, but we're refining it. Let me show you a few more forms of the iterator. There's a shorthand for primes.iter, which is just to borrow primes. In the context of a for loop, it does the same thing. Now in some cases, while you're iterating through a vector, you might want to be changing the individual elements as we go. So to do that, there are two ways, either primes.iter mute, which is a form of the iteration where we're borrowing a mutable reference to each element. Shorthand for that is, you might be able to guess, is to borrow the vector mutably. So there are a lot more methods in vector. I encourage you to explore the documentation for vector. Lots of different methods there to handle many different use cases, things you might want to do with vectors like sorting, etc. But let's move on to a different kind of type. It's similar to vector, only it's implemented in terms of a ring buffer. So it's more efficient to add and remove elements on both ends. And that's called the vec dq. Now, unlike vec, we have to actually introduce where vec dq comes from. It comes from the standard library collections vec dq. Why didn't we have to do that with vec? Because vec is so useful, it's included by default, what they call the prelude. Now, by default, there's no equivalent to the vec macro for vec dq, so we got to go back to pushing prime numbers in here manually. But you see, we have two options. We can either push onto the front or the back. Let's push onto the back some different values. Running that. Now that works, but we could have also just taken the two and pushed it onto the front at the end, and we'll get the same result. Cases where you might use vec dq instead of vec are when you are doing this sort of thing where you're adding things to the vector either at the front or the end. It's more efficient to use a vec dq this way. Anytime you have a circular loop or ring buffer. So let's move on to a completely different kind of collection called the hash map. The hash map is our first associative container. So it's one that allows us to have sort of like a dictionary, like you can store values and attach keys to them so that you can find those values later. And the keys are easy to look up quickly. So the example I'm going to use is a hash map that is representing a grid like in a map. And we're going to, through that analogy, introduce the concept of insertion. So with the grid, you can insert into the grid and let's give like coordinates here, two, three, and then a value of tree. Now, just like the vec dq, I need to import the hash map in, into our collections. We can drop the vec q for now. And let's add something else to our grid. Something like a rock. Now to illustrate how you'd walk through or iterate a grid, it's similar to how you do with a vector. Only while you're iterating, you get the, both the keys and the values out as tuples. So key value in grid. Print line something at something value key. And of course, I used the wrong keyword there. It's four. Let's run that. So you can see with the inlay hints that the key is borrowing the coordinates from the grid. We don't actually get a copy of it. An alternative to insert, which is sometimes useful when you want to update something in a grid, is entry. So we can say, give me the entry into the hash map. So we would put in more coordinates here. Just making them up on the fly. Only instead of giving a value here, we get an entry out, which could be present in the map or could not be. With this entry, we would do something like or insert to give it a value if it wasn't there. And we'll say something like empty. Out of that, we get a mutable reference. So we could do something like assign it to, let's say, a bird. As long as we put a dereference in front because we're getting a mutable reference. Now we print this out. Now we can change these coordinates so that we're replacing the rock with the bird if we have the same coordinates. So another thing you can do with the hash map is remove entries explicitly. Let's say we want to remove that rock. And here's where we're going to use a slightly different syntax. We need to borrow the key because we're not putting the key into the grid. We're just letting the remove borrow a key to search for a matching one in the map and then remove it. So a couple more things you can do with the grid map. You can index it directly. Let's say we had some coordinates 
and we'll pick that tree for example we could just say let the cell and the grid equal that grid and borrow those coordinates and let's print out what's there take this out just to reuse it and we'll put cell and chords here run this again the thing about the indexer is if there's not something at that place in the hash map it actually panics so if you're not sure if something is in a hash map given a key and you don't want your program to panic the alternative is to use the get method it works just like the indexer only instead of giving you the value it gives you an option value so that's suitable for saying if let sum and then put that and then we can have an alternate else that says there's nothing there now when we run it we see that there's nothing at 2 2 okay let's talk a little bit about the name hash map why is it called hash map not something called dictionary for example the answer is that the implementation of HashMap is optimized such that it uses a hash table to store the keys and values. So that means that our keys have to be hashable. I'm not going to go into exactly what hashable means, other than to say that it's an operation that reduces our keys into simple numbers. And if you had your own type for that key, you'd have to implement the hash trait to make it work with the hash map. Now, an alternate to the hash map that doesn't require hashing is called the B tree map. And we could use that here too if we imported it. So working the same as a hash map for most methods, we see no difference here, except for inside the implementation, these keys are no longer hashed into a hash table. They're actually sorted in a B tree. Again, leaving it up to you to look up what exactly a B tree is. Suffice to say, it's just a way of sorting the keys using the relative orders of the key values. So that means the keys have to have some notion of order least to greatest. So there's a special form of a map in Rust and that's called a set. And that's in the case where you don't actually need a value. So let's say for example, we wanted to have our primes again. And in this case, instead of storing it as a vector, let's say we want to have it very fast to find individual prime numbers by their values. So for example, a hash map, and let's say we're inserting our prime numbers in here. But what do we put for the value? Well, we can say there is no value using the unit or empty tuple, and that works just fine. Like we showed before, we can iterate through this. But it's sort of clumsy to have to have this unit type, so Rust has specializations, hash set, and for B-tree map, there's B-tree set. In this case, we don't actually have these units at all, and we don't have that empty value anymore. And it works just fine. Now you see we're printing them out in a random order. If you wanted them to be in order, of course, we'd have to go to a B tree set. Run that. And we'll see they're stored in order now. Okay, one final collection I want to talk about is the binary heap. Binary heap you can think of as a special form of vector where the values are sort of held loosely in a form where they can be pulled out in order. So let's say we inserted a bunch of primes and just... Uh, Going to put them all in a different order here. Uh, with uh, binary heap, it's push just like a vector. And then when we run this, we can see that they're in a random order, not even the order in which we push them. The special thing about a binary heap is its pop method. That's the point at which the items are sorted. We would use it in the form of a while let loop. We have while let some prime equal primes dot pop. Copy that print over to here and remove the iterator running that we can see that it sorted them from highest to lowest so again just like with vec and with hash map and hash set b tree map and b tree set there are a lot more methods things you can do with these collections and i'll leave it up to you to check out the documentation for them so in summary we learned about various collections that are provided by rust standard library and introduced the concept of iterators these are going to come up a lot more in future videos in the next video, we're going to talk about lifetimes. I can't wait for that. So thank you for watching. I hope you keep up with the series.